sides. A tragic trail of civil wars, bloodshed, migration crisis, food shortage, disease, and extreme poverty marks South Sudan's history. It is the story of years of insecurity, human rights abuses, and marginalization. The region that makes up modern-day South Sudan was conquered and colonized by both Egypt and the British Empire between 1805 and 1899. In the southern part of the country, slavery was common. The neglected South was left out as a result of British missionaries' northward focused efforts. Between 1955 and 1972, the first Sudanese civil war broke out with the aim of establishing the South as an independent state. The conflict lasted for 17 years before the establishment of the Southern Sudan Autonomous Region, or SSAR, as a result of a deal reached in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. President Jafar Nimairi of Sudan dissolved the Christian-dominated SSAR and declared the nation an Islamic State in 1983. In response, the Second Sudanese Civil War started. More South Sudanese died as a result of internal strife, notably the horrific Boer massacre in 1991 and the ensuing famine that killed an estimated 27,000 people. The civil war, which lasted 22 years, was the longest in African history. The South Sudan administration and the Sudanese government signed a peace accord in Nairobi in 2005. South Sudanese politician Salva Kiir Mayardit was named vice president of both Sudan and Southern Sudan upon the death of the vice president of Sudan, John Garang. Both of them belong to the South Sudan's liberation movement. South Sudan declared independence on July 9, 2011, after a referendum in January of that year found that 98.83% of the population supported independence. It thus became the 54th country in Africa and the 193rd country to join the UN. Juba became the capital. Two years after becoming an independent state, there was a political tug-of-war between President Kier and former Deputy Raik Mashar. Kier accused Mashar and 10 other leaders of plotting to overthrow him in a coup. This ignited a civil war. By March 2014, 800,000 South Sudanese had been internally displaced within this fragile nation, making up the one million people who had been compelled to flee their homes due to conflict. This forced migration also resulted in food shortages and rising disease rates. In April 2019, President Kier, Mashar and three other South Sudanese leaders 
took part in a retreat in the Vatican during which Pope Francis knelt and kissed their feet, sending a powerful appeal for peace. This symbolic gesture of the Holy Father resulted in Kier forgiving his Bet Noir Mashar and agreeing to a peace treaty on February 20, 2020. Two days later, they formed a national unity government. Internecine clashes still plague the nation. Today, over 70% of the population, including 4.5 million children, need humanitarian aid. The birth of South Sudan in 2011 is intrinsically linked to Christianity. Christians comprise the bulk of the population in the southern part of pre-partition Sudan. Most of the believers are either Catholic or Anglican, with the presence of other Protestant and Eritrean Ethiopian Orthodox churches. It was the antagonism of the Muslim majority north towards Christians in the south of Sudan that sparked two devastating civil wars. The one that lasted from 1955, post-independence, to 1972, and the other lasting from 1983 to 2005. When it became evident that Christians in the South did not wish to remain part of Muslim-majority Sudan, a plebiscite was held in 2011, during which 98% of the southern population voted for independence. The whole of Sudan was part of the ancient Nubian Empire during biblical days, and the gospel reached that region in the 4th century AD with the Muslim Bedouin onslaught from Arabia via Egypt. Christianity was restricted to several pockets over the centuries. By the 1600s, Sudan was mostly Islamized, except for the south, where a majority of the tribe still adhered to animism. Missionaries brought the Catholic faith to Sudan in 1842. It was seven years later that the third head of the Vicarate Apostolic of Central Africa the most Reverend Ignatius Noblicker undertook an expedition to the south and opened a mission station at Gondokoro in 1852. Catholic faith took root there with the baptism of eight men that same year. It was the future saint, Father Daniel Camboni, who came up with an ambitious plan for the regeneration of Africa. He proposed training centers for the priests, and between 1895 and 1910, the Kamboni mission was established and it played a key role in spreading Catholicism in the southern part of Sudan. The Italian Verona Fathers and the Mill Hill missionaries also made significant contributions to spread the faith in the south. It was the church-run periodicals in southern Sudan which helped build a southern identity among Christians apart from imparting church doctrine. Catholic priests also denounced the Islamization efforts of the post-independence government. The church remained with the Southerners during the civil wars, supporting them in all ways possible. The hierarchy also exhorted people to vote for the secession during the 2011 plebiscite. There are 35 million Catholics in South Sudan, and they are spread across the Archdiocese of Juba and six other suffragan dioceses. Most of the Catholics belong to the Roman Rite, while the others follow the Armenian, Melkite, Syriac, and Maronite Rites. Saint Daniele Comboni was an Italian Catholic missionary who was remembered for his humanitarian work in Africa during the 19th century. He is the founder of the Camboni Missionaries of the Heart of Jesus and the Camboni Missionary Sisters. Father Camboni is also known as the Apostle of Central Africa.
for his tireless efforts to spread Christianity in that part of Africa and improve the living conditions of the people. Born in Limone sul Garda in Italy on March 15, 1831, he joined the seminary when he was 16 with a desire to become a missionary and soon dedicated himself fully to this cause. As part of his mission, he founded several schools and churches across Central Africa. While providing medical aid, promoting education, and protecting women and children from exploitation, his lifelong commitment resulted in him being canonized by Pope John Paul II on October 5, 2003. St. Josephine Bakita was a Sudanese-born slave turned Canossian religious sister. Born in Darfur, Sudan in 1869, Bakita experienced great suffering during her childhood when she was sold into slavery at the age of seven or eight. Josephine Bakita's family was part of the Daju ethnic group and adhered to traditional tribal practices. However, at some point during her childhood, around age seven or eight, Josephine's life took a devastating turn when she was kidnapped by Arab slave traders who sold her multiple times before she ended up in Italy. During this period, it is likely that Josephine endured physical abuse alongside psychological torture at the hands of those who enslaved her for years until she was finally freed in Italy. Josephine eventually ended up in the care of nuns of the Canossian Congregation in Venice, where she embraced Catholicism as her new faith and chose Saint Anne as her patron saint. Her life in the Canossian convent was marked by extraordinary humility, religious fervor, and love for everyone. Sadly, the news of her beautification in 1992 was censored in Sudan. But nine months later, Pope John Paul II visited Sudan and honored her publicly. Eventually, she was canonized by Pope Benedict XVI on October 1st, 2000, making her the very first Sudanese-born saint.
those who preach the and gospel. And we'll open with uh, some words of scripture. You and let the, our meeting and gathering be open by the word of prayer by general moderator of the Church of Scotland. Welcome. Gracious Heavenly Father, we gather together in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We cherish your promise that you will be with us through the Spirit whenever we gather in your name. We thank you for this space and ask that for all present, it might be a space of hope, a space where love is shared and known and experienced. We are in Freedom Hall. May indeed this be a place of new beginning, a place You, Lord, spoke of the truth setting us free. May your truth seep into all our hearts. May your wisdom, grace, and peace flow into the hearts and minds of all who are in transition in this community of South us all by your grace to find our way home, to be at peace with one another, to live without fear, to know the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless all that we do here in your name, and we ask this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now we'll have a brief presentation of the various groups that are present here for this event. His Holiness, Book Francis, Right Reverend Justin will be Bishop of Canterbury, Right Reverend Dr. Ian Greenchell, the moderator of Many people converge today to meet you in this Freedom Hall, and they are grateful for this opportunity. Your visit here and your meeting with them is a great sign of hope for them and a strong encouragement for them. And this is a message of peace they are waiting from you. From this gathering, there is people and I ask them to rise up and wave with their hand up. ويرفعوا أياديهم ممكن ما موجود okay. I do apologize a little bit for the sound quality we are working on getting a good stream for that for those of you listening in on the radio you'll uh, hear the groups uh, clapping and waving as they uh, greet the Pope they can rise up and wave. And the three religious leaders smiling and waving at the different groups as they are introduced. Let them rise up and wave where they are.
The people from Lair, let them greet and rise up and wait. Yeah, only one here. And wave. Khaled Nasbitat, Maban, Yubungu Folk, Wa Kaman Nasbitat, Rang. There is a representative of, of from Maban from Sudan. Mukin Yubungu Folk, Kaman, Fima Albitam, Nashuf. Let us uh, be calm in our place, and there is a video which will be here. Let us watch it for a few minutes. The video you just heard uh, is going to be uh, presented here in the hall for those present, and especially for the leaders and the international community watching this event. Uh, will be introduced and commented upon uh, by the Deputy Special Representative of the Secretary General, Resident Coordinator, Humanitarian Coordinator for the United Nations, Ms. Sarah Bisolo Nianti. Uh, let us keep calm and watch this video for a few minutes. And so again, for those of you uh, listening in on the radio without the video feed, uh, we should have some commentary here in a moment explaining uh, the situation of some of these internally displaced persons uh, in South Sudan. South Sudan has one of the uh, largest crises of in internally displaced people uh, in the world. And uh, it is this humanitarian crisis that is being addressed and these three religious leaders are here in part to highlight that tragedy, that tremendous need. And the video uh, is showing the different parts of the country and the uh, camps where the government, where international agencies are trying their best to help the people who have been forced to flee their homes. Uh, but because of the great need, because of the dire situation economically in the country, because of the conflict that continues to go on throughout the country, uh, even the refugee camps, the internally displaced persons camps, uh, the camps for the protection of individuals uh, are, uh, again, for those of you watching the videos, you can see this, are not in... Uh, great condition you have people testifying uh, in the video of the suffering that they have endured from floods uh, from violence a woman who had to flee her home with her children uh, single women who have had to flee they're caring for children who have lost their parents noted, despite the best efforts of humanitarian groups, NGOs, religious groups, uh, nonetheless great sufferings in these camps, and of course the camps themselves are or should not be uh, permanent. They are meant to help people so that they can return to their homes. And it is the prayer of the people here today, the prayer of the Pope, of the Archbishop of Canterbury, of the moderator of the Church of Scotland, uh, that peace may reign, that peace may come to this country so that the people are able to return to their homes and begin rebuilding their lives anew. So 
Sudan, as many people know, is uh, the newest independent nation in the world. And since 2013, now for 10 years, uh, conflicts and violence on a large scale throughout the whole country have forced millions of people to flee from their homes in search of security. Uh, several million internally displaced, several million more have fled the country entirely. And the ones who are still remaining in South Sudan, again, numbering in the millions, uh, are, are in camps where they're searching for peace and security in order to be able to return to their homes. And we are expecting comments from the uh, Special Representative of the UN Secretary General uh, momentarily, who will uh, offer some facts about the situation on the ground in South Sudan. Give this few minutes for the speeches from the selected uh, kids from ID camp. And these speeches are the expression of their heart. None root right for them. So let us listen to what they have to say. And uh, uh, it looks like a brief change in the program where we will go directly to the testimonies from several children who are from different camps. Speech, the Deputy Special Representative of the Resident Coordinator and Humanitarian Coordinator in South Sudan, Sarah Beslonyanti. Your Holiness Pope Francis, I'm honored to... Uh, sorry about that. Uh, we are having the speech from the Special Representative, which we hear now. ...and the moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland with your esteemed delegations and the people of South Sudan. Observed. This is a momentous opportunity to draw the world's attention to the situation in South Sudan at a time when multiple humanitarian crises are emerging concurrently. The humanitarian context in South Sudan is worrying. For over a decade, the South Sudanese people have experienced conflict, social and political instability, climate shocks, violence, displacement, food insecurity, lack of education, opportunities, and access to health care systems. Today, over 2 million people are displaced across the country. 2 million are refugees outside the country. South Sudan ranks fourth on the list of world's most neglected displacement crises. It is also the largest refugee crisis in Africa. Extremes of food insecurity and malnutrition affect two-thirds of the country's population. This situation makes South Sudan one of the worst food emergencies globally. An estimated 8 million people are expected to experience food insecurity in 2023. In addition to this insecurity, fueled by intercommunal violence, crime and impunity continue to hamper South Sudan's peace efforts. Women and girls are extremely vulnerable to sexual and gender-based violence, and they risk being violated while carrying out their daily routines. Children risk being abducted, recruited in local armed groups, or being trafficked. Access to justice and the rule of law are limited for many people who experience The cumulative impact of four consecutive years of above normal rainfall has contributed to the destruction and damaging of people's lives and livelihoods. Such climate shocks exacerbate the already dire situation. While people's needs are the resources available to support them are dwindling. In 2023, humanitarian partners will need $1.7 billion to 6.8 million people. Given the everyday humanity choices in prioritizing needs, such decision making is heartbreaking given the depth of vulnerability and needs. Holiness, since my arrival in South Sudan at the beginning of 2020. Once again, we do apologize for the feed. 
Uh, I'll pick up where... If the women of South Sudan are given an opportunity to develop, to have space to be productive, South Sudan will be transformed. Women are the key to transformation, and they can only lead their communities toward a better future. Only when there is peace will children be able to reach their full potential and will people be able to live a life of dignity, joined in coexistence and commonality while celebrating differences. Humanitarians are working around the clock to respond to the urgent communities. However, security challenges often force staff members to relocate until the situation approves. dangerous context for aid workers, followed by Afghanistan and Syria. In 2022, over 390 incidents against humanitarians were reported. Nine humanitarians lost their lives in the line of duty. Respect the international law. Access by humanitarians to the we with our partners across the humanitarian peace and development spectrum to support the people of South Sudan on their path to peace. We will also continue to work closely with the government of South Sudan to enhance our joint efforts to positively impact not only our job, but also And we do apologize once again for the audio quality there. Uh, for the moment, uh, while the representative is finishing her speech, as we do hear from uh, the stories of the children from the various camps, uh, happily we do have the text of those. So although it will be difficult to hear perhaps some of these witness testimonies, uh, I think we will try to read them for you uh, while also allowing the children to say a few words themselves when we do have a clear feed. But we'll read those through uh, from beginning to end because it is important to hear the witnesses of these young children who have been forced to live their lives to grow up in these camps. And our first witness is Joseph Latgatmai from the International Displaced Persons Camp in Bentu. Again, since we do have uh, issues with the sound feed, I'll be reading uh, his testimony for you. It begins, first of all, I thank the Lord Jesus who has given me this chance to stand before you, our religious leaders, and the Christians who have come 
for this spiritual visit. My name is Joseph Latgatmai. I'm a Presbyterian Christian at Northwestern Upper Nile Presbyterian Church. I'm 16 years old. I arrived at the protection of civilian camp in Bentiu with my parents in May 2015, and I've been living in the camp for more than eight years. Through our God, in Bursi, in Jesus' name. I entered at the age of eight and grew up there. I entered the, the POC camp at the age of eight and grew up there. My life in the camp is not pleasant. I am worried about how my life and the life of the other children children will be in the future. Throughout this year, my parents and I, as well as others displaced permanent, have been able to survive because of humanitarian aid. I had been pleased. I would have been in my home of organ, live, but a lie, and uh, enjoy my childhood. Why are we serving in the IDV camp? Because of, of the ongoing in our country. Why are we suffering in the IDP camp? Because of the ongoing conflicts in our country, the youngest independent country. We have also been affected by floods since 2020, and thousands of families have been displaced from their villages and towns, losing their livestock and crops. Therefore, I am appealing to our leaders in this great nation of South Sudan to bring lasting peace, love, unity, and prosperity to our country. I am asking you, our religious leaders, to continue praying for lasting peace in South Sudan. May God listen to our prayers. I am asking you, our religious leader, to continue praying my last Lasting peace in South Sudan. May God. And we do thank you for your patience. As we uh, read, we will continue to try and uh, fill in the blanks, as it were, with the speakers. Our next speaker is Johnson Juma Alex. Uh, who's in the protection of civilians at camp in Malakal. And Father will be reading uh, his speech. My name is Johnson Juma Alex. I belong to the Episcopal Church of South Sudan. I am 14 years old. I live in Block B, Sector 2, of the Malakal Protection of Civilians Camp, POC. I'm a student in Primary 3. I live in the POC with my mother and my father. They do not have jobs, but one of my uncles sends them some help from Juba. When he sends a little money, I am able to buy some clothes. I came to the POC in 2014 because of the problems in Malakal town. Peace is good problems are not. We want peace so that people can go back to Malakau, back to their homes. Life in the POC is not good because the area is small and very crowded. There's not enough space to play football. Many children do not go to school because there are not enough teachers and schools for all of us. I want to have a good future where there is peace and children can go to school. Life in the POC is not good, but we thank the United Nations because they give us protection and they give us food. We want...
POC in 2014 cause of problem in Malakal town. And I believe that we have picked up a different feed, which hopefully will be a little bit more uh, stable. Are not in. The voice you're hearing now is uh, Johnson Juma Alex. Uh, Father just read his uh, speech, but we'll hear again in his own words and in his own voice uh, his important testimony. But to the house, life in POC is not good, but is be a herial and is small. There is not a lot of space to believe the body, to place the body. Many children is not go to school. Because there are not for us, I want to help good future. Well, there is peace, space, peace and children, and can go to school. Life in the POC is not good. But we thank the UN because the peace and food. We want, we go to in the church to pray so that God give us peace and we thank God. Thank thank you. So it's just important to remember, friends, that uh, these young people don't have access to a very good educational system. So as you heard, that young man is 14 years old, but he's reading in a rather slow and broken style because uh, his own education has been so thwarted by the situation in South Sudan. And as we said, our next uh, testimony for, will be from a girl living in a refugee camp uh, in Juba. As Father mentioned, uh, these young children are uh, learning uh, in very desperate circumstances. Uh, they did write their testimonies uh, themselves uh, with help and assistance from their teachers. Uh, but you can you can hear even as they're uh, pronouncing their words, the the very strong efforts they're making for many of them. English is not their first language. Their tribal language would be their first language. Some of them happily have at least some opportunity to uh, improve their education. Again, in very, very dire and difficult circumstances. And uh, one of the big efforts of the international community of uh, religious organizations represented by the three leaders here uh, is to help give them that opportunity to continue to improve their educations and to bring uh, peace and a measure of, of progress and improvement uh, to their to their very young country. We're now having a, a moment of song uh, to animate the event here and before we hear from Rebecca. And once again, uh, due to the due to the difficulties with the feed, Father is going to read the testimony straight through. We, you will probably be able to hear a little bit of Rebecca's voice uh, as well. Dear Pope Francis, my name is Rebecca Nyakur. 
I am a member of World Twenty Parish and I live in the. You and it is an honor to be. I'm very happy to meet you, and it is an honor to be here with you. On behalf of the children of South Sudan, I want to thank you for your visit. We know that you are a great leader, because despite your bad knee, you have come to be with us, bringing hope and a message of peace. We know that you love children, and that you always say, we children are important to our country and to the church. Pope Francis, we also love you. Thank you for the love you have for us. We, the children of South Sudan, like dancing and singing very much. This is how we praise God, who is always with us. Continue to teach us to be the friends of Jesus and continue to speak to our people so that we can all come together in peace. In the name of Jesus, I want to ask you to give a special blessing for all the children of South Sudan so that we can grow together in peace and in love. Thank you for being a great messenger of God. We will never forget this day. Pope Francis, we love you. Thank you for loving South Sudan. Thank you very much. And that was uh, Rebecca, a girl from the uh, refugee camp in Juba. And each of our three speakers was able to uh, greet the Pope and the Archbishop and the moderator and say a few words to each of them. And we're now going to hear a prayer from Archbishop Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury and spiritual head of the Anglican Communion. Again, we will be providing, uh, I believe Father will be reading the prayer to make up for the bad connection. The technological uh, and technical difficulties we've been experiencing are themselves a very poignant uh, will also uh, be an eloquent testimony to the, the very uh, desperate needs for infrastructure in this country where you see an event as important as this one Father, uh, still experiencing technical difficulties. And now the Archbishop of Canterbury. Your arms, these young people, may they be close to you and comforted by you. May they know your kingdom even as they see and experience the sufferings of our world. May they be the ones who take us by the hand and lead us to your glory. Grant your children and protection of your presence. Lord Jesus, who fled persecution as a baby, you know confusion and chaos of your people. You died all to new everlasting life. On the cross, you died for your enemies and brought us all to new everlasting life. Grant us your humility and your holiness, and walk with us on the heavy path of the cross that leads to eternal joy with you. Holy Spirit, who brings life to the places of darkness, love to hearts of hate, hope to a world of fear and despair. Rest in our hearts today, transform our lives so that we might transform our world. May your fire burn away all hatred and bitterness, fear and enmity, and set us alight with your love, your justice, and your peace. And we do thank you for your patience. It sounds like I've been informed by our technicians we are trying to get a better feed 
So we thank you for your patience and for sticking with us for this important meeting with internally displaced persons. We're now going to hear a reflection by Pope Francis. And in some ways, this will be easier. The Holy Father will be speaking in Italian, so I will be reading over the Holy Father's voice. Uh, I'll be providing an English translation of the Pope's remarks. And it's just going to be a moment. The Holy Father uh, is brought the microphone. And we are, you can hear there, the Holy Father has begun speaking. Again, we have a little bit of a, a trouble with the audio feed, uh, but in any case, we will be reading a translation. So I will try and keep up with the Holy Father uh, from here. And following this event, we will have the full text of the Pope's address, uh, along with other materials, including an article about this event. So thank you for your patience. <music> I'm with you here, and I suffer for you and with you. Joseph, you asked a crucial question addressing one of the tests, uh, one of the speakers this morning, this afternoon. Joseph, you asked a crucial question. Why do we have to suffer in a camp for displaced persons? Why? Why do so many children and young people like you end up here rather than studying in school or playing in a nice open space? You answered your own question when you said that it is because of the ongoing conflicts in the country. Due to the devastation caused by human violence, as well as that caused by the floods, millions of our brothers and sisters, like you, including many mothers with children, have had to leave their lands and abandon their villages and their homes. Sadly, in this war-torn country, being a displaced person or a refugee has become a common and collective experience. We pause briefly for the translator to catch up. Here in Juba at the Freedom Hall, the Pope is speaking in Italian, uh, of course, which is not a language known by those present. Uh, so the solution they come up with, the Holy Father offers a couple of paragraphs of his speech, uh, which is then uh, read in... <laughs> is speaking uh, primarily to them, as we heard taking up uh, the question voiced by uh, Joseph, one of the children who just spoke. And we take up once again the words of the Holy Father. This is why I wanted to renew my forceful and heartfelt appeal to end all conflict and to resume the priest's process in a serious way so that violence can end and people can return to living in dignity. 
Only with peace, stability, and justice can there be development and social reintegration. There is no room for further delay. Great numbers of children born in recent years have known only the reality of camps for displaced persons. They have no memory of what it means to have a home. They are losing their connection with their native land, their roots, and their traditions. And the Holy Father, we can hear his voice a little bit. Hopefully the feed is getting better, is now addressing uh, the remarks uh, made by Johnson, one of the other uh, young children who brought their testimony here to this place in Juba. The Pope continues, the future cannot lie in refugee camps. As you said, Johnson, there is need for all children like yourself to have the opportunity to go to school and to have a place to play football. There's a need for you to grow as an open society, for different groups to mingle and form a single people by embracing the challenges of integration, even learning the languages spoken throughout the country, and not just those in a particular ethnic group, in your own particular ethnic group. This means embracing the marvelous risk of knowing and accepting those who are different, discovering the beauty of a reconciled fraternity, and experiencing the thrilling challenge of freely shaping your own future along with that of the entire community. It is absolutely essential to avoid ostracizing groups and ghettoizing human beings. To meet all and these challenges, however, the there is a need for peace a and for the help of many, so indeed, of everyone. And the, as the translator offers the Pope's remarks in English, again, we have a terrible feed, um, a few words. Uh, the, there has been a peace process in place. Uh, since the foundation of South Sudan. Uh, it has gone in fits and starts, and the Holy Father, other leaders around the world, have consistently called for that's, that peace process to be a serious peace process, not just words, not just meetings, not just uh, surface attempts uh, while violence is ongoing. They, they call for the peace process to for those sides to take serious and definite steps to bring peace to this country. And to have a field to play football. There is a need for you to grow, for different groups to mingle and to form, embracing the challenges of integration one of the things that we see here and in the various events of the papal visit of the pilgrimage of peace as the holy fathers called it the ecumenical pilgrimage of peace of these three leaders uh, has been the opportunity to bring people together from different ethnic groups from different parts of the country uh, who are united in a common desire for peace for their country. The uh, English have had a presence in the country for hundreds of years, and this is especially why we see the Anglican and the Church of Scotland leaders here along with the Pope. Of course, the Catholic Church has had here a presence for hundreds of years as well. Um, and it is certainly not an exaggeration to say that the history of colonization has contributed a, a, an overwhelming amount to the conflicts and the violence and the poverty of this country, of this new country. And that is why it is not the responsibility of, of the more advanced nations to uh, save this country by any means, but certainly to acknowledge their responsibility and 
to contribute where we can to help uh, bring this country to uh, a better future and to help the South Sudanese uh, come to that better future. And the Holy Father is going to be addressing that, I know, in his speech today as well. Uh, we pick up again, and again, it sounds like we now have a little bit better feed, so we will try to listen to the words of the Holy Father, his own voice, speaking in Italian. And if we have a good feed, we'll continue with the words of the translator. And otherwise, I'll be picking up the translation again once the Holy Father uh, finishes the section of his speech. Le madri, le donne, sono la chiave per trasformare il paese. Se riceveranno le giuste opportunità attraverso la loro laboriosità e la loro attitudine a custodire la vita, avranno la capacità di cambiare il volto del Sud Sudan, di dargli uno sviluppo di coeso. Ma vi prego, prego tutte queste terre, la donna sia protetta, la donna sia rispettata, valorizzata e onorata. Per favore, proteggere, rispettare, valorizzare e onorare ogni donna, casa, giovane, adulta, madre e nonna. Unfortunately, not much we can do about the, the uh, food. Uh, very warm. Uh, thank you for the technicians who are desperately trying to uh, provide the food for us. Uh, however, due to the quality, I will continue with the Holy Father's speech. I would like to thank Deputy Special Representative Sarah Vassolonianti for telling us that today represents an opportunity for people to realize what's been going on for the years in this country, a country with the greatest enduring refugee crisis on the continent. At least four million children of this land are displaced. Food insecurity and malnutrition affects two-thirds of, of the population, and forecasts predict a humanitarian tragedy that could further worsen in the course of this year. So I would like to thank you, above all, because you and many others did not sit around analyzing the situation, but went straight to work. You, madam, have traveled throughout the country. You've looked into the eyes of mothers and witnessed the pain they feel for the situation of their children. I was moved when you said that, despite all they are suffering, smiles and hope have never faded from their faces. I also agree with what you said about them. Mothers, women, are the key to transforming the country. If they receive the proper opportunities, through their industriousness and their natural gift of protecting life, they will have the ability to change the face of South Sudan, to give it a peaceful and cohesive development. I ask you, I ask all the people of these lands, to ensure that women are protected, respected, valued, and honored. Please, please, protect, respect, appreciate, and honor every woman, every girl, every young woman, mother and grandmother. Otherwise, there will be no future. This has been a consistent theme of the Holy Father throughout his journey here to South Sudan. Uh, the importance of women who have suffered so much in this country. Uh, we have heard harrowing stories of women kidnapped, abused, uh, taken into uh, sexual slavery. Uh, it is really, truly heartrending. And the Holy Father has drawn attention to what they suffer, recognizing at the same time that it is women and how women are treated that will make it possible to have peace in South Sudan. The Holy Father is speaking once again. We'll uh, continue.
continue here with his speech. Again, trying to ensure that you can hear his own words in his own voice. And as long as the feed holds, we'll let you listen to him, even with the uh, unfortunate breaks. And then when the translator comes back, I will be reading over the translator uh, because the translator's microphone, unfortunately, is, is having tremendous difficulties. Thank you once again for your patience. Siate semi di speranza, nei quali già si intravede l'albero di un speriamo vicino, porterà frutto. Sì, sarete voi gli alberi che assorbiranno l'inquinamento di violenze e restituiranno l'ossigeno della fraternità. È vero, non volete. Once more, I look at I see you are and uh, again uh, uh, the translation of the Holy Father's words, brothers and sisters, once more I look out at you, I see your eyes, weary but bright, eyes that have not, not lost hope, I see your mouths which have not lost the strength to pray and to sing, I see you with empty hands but hearts full of faith. You bear the burden of a painful past, yet you never stop dreaming of a better future. In our meeting today, we would like to give wings to your hope. We hope and believe that now, even in the camps for displaced wings persons, where sadly you are forced to live due to the situation in your country, a new seed can sprout as the dry and barren soil, a new seed that will bear rich fruit. That is what I want to tell you, that you are the seed of a new South Sudan, a seed for the fertile and lush growth of this country. You, from all your different ethnic groups, you who have suffered and are still suffering, you who do not want to respond to evil with more evil, you who choose fraternity and forgiveness, are even now cultivating a better tomorrow. A tomorrow that is being born today, wherever you find yourselves, from your ability to cooperate, to weave webs of communion and paths of reconciliation, with those who, while different from you in terms of ethnicity and origin, are still your neighbors. Be seeds of hope, which make it possible for us already to glimpse the tree that one day, hopefully in the near future, will bear fruit. Yes, you will be the trees that absorb the pollution of years of violence and restore the oxygen of fraternity. True, right now you are planted where you don't want to be, but precisely from this situation of hardship and uncertainty, you can reach out to those around you and experience that you all are rooted in the one human family. From here, you must make a new start to realize that you are all brothers and sisters, children on earth of God in heaven, the Father of us all. As the translator continues, uh, you can hear uh, some in the background, the, the people here responding to the Holy Father's words of encouragement uh, with, with enthusiasm uh, as the Pope's words are translated to them and applauding uh, the Pope's words and applauding his hopes for them you that they can be seeds for a better future of South Sudan. Children on earth, the father of us all. 
the Holy Father picks up his speech again, addressing the dear friends, as he says, and dear friends who are present here for this event. In Sud Sudan, i giovani crescono facendo tesoro. Anche se la narrativa di questi anni è stata caratterizzata dalla violenza, è possibile anche una nuova, una nuova narrativa dove quanto si è partito non sia dimenticato, ma venga abitato dalla luce della fraternità. Una narrativa che metta al centro non solo la fraternità, ma il desiderio di Siate voi, giovani di etnie diverse, The Holy Father, as we said, has encouraged uh, those present here despite their differences. Uh, they are united in suffering. They are united in suffering the consequences of conflict in their country. And so the Holy Father uh, encouraged them to weave webs of communion and paths of reconciliation with their neighbors, even if they are different from them. Remind us that and he continues, once up. again, uh, the translator is providing the English translation for those present. That the Pope continues, dear friends, to speak of roots reminds us that every plant springs up from a seed. It's a beautiful thing, he says. The people here care deeply about their roots. I remember reading that in these lands the roots must never be forgotten, because the ancestors remind us who we are and what our path should be. Without them, we are lost, frightened, and without a compass. There is no future without a past. Those are the words of C. Carlos Sare, uh, speaking of his experience uh, as a Cambodian uh, missionary. The Pope continues, In South Sudan, young people grow up benefiting from the stories of the elderly. And although the chapter of recent years has been one of violence, it is possible and indeed necessary to launch a new chapter, beginning with yourselves. A new chapter of encounter, which does not forget past sufferings, but radiates the joyful light of fraternity. A chapter that does not focus only on reports of tragedy, but also on the ardent desire for peace. May you, young people of different ethnicities, write the first pages of this new chapter. Although conflict, violence, and hatred have replaced good memories on the first pages of this life of this new republic, you must, you must be the ones to rewrite its history as a history of peace. I thank you for your strength and perseverance, and for all the good you do, which is so pleasing to God, and which enriches each day of your lives. of our lives. Oyetivi di Asal Soccorso Genti, credo sia molto. La popolazione 
parte dello sviluppo. Per esempio, aiutare ad apprendere tecniche e aggiornare la In addition, I will continuing with the Holy Father's translation. In addition, I would like to address a word of gratitude to all those who help you, often in conditions of hardship, but also in emergency situations. I thank the ecclesial communities for their efforts, for their efforts which deserve to be supported. I thank the missionaries and humanitarian and international organizations, in particular the United Nations, for the important work that they do. To be sure, a country cannot survive on external means of support alone, especially if it possesses a territory so rich in resources. At the present time, however, those means of support are badly needed. I would like to honor the many humanitarian workers who have lost their lives and to plead for respect for those who offer help and for the structures that assist the population. They should not become targets of assaults and vandalism. Together with urgently needed aid, I believe that it is very important in the future to accompany the population on the path of development, for example, by helping them to learn up-to-date practices in the areas of agriculture and livestock management so as to facilitate a more independent growth. I plead with everyone from the heart, please let us help South Sudan. Let us not abandon its population. They have suffered and they continue to suffer so greatly. Once again, we hear the words of the Holy Father in Italian. Contribuendo al suo sviluppo in modo costruttivo e pacifico. Mi ha chiesto Rebecca, mi ha chiesto una benedizione speciale per i bambini del sud sud, proprio perché possiate crescere tutti insieme nella pace. Noi tre come fratelli daremo la benedizione. Il mio fratello Justin. In conclusion, I would like to and finally, Pope brings his speech to a close. In conclusion, I'd like to mention the many South Sudanese refugees living outside the country and those who cannot return because their territories have been occupied. I'm close to them, and I trust that they can once again take an active role in shaping the future of their land, contributing to its development in a constructive and peaceful manner. Rebecca, you asked me for a special blessing upon the children of South Sudan, precisely so that all of you might grow up together in peace. This blessing will be very special, since I will be giving it together with my brothers Justin and Ian. With it comes the blessing of so many of our Christian brothers and sisters in the world who embrace and encourage you, knowing that you, your faith, your inner strength, and your dreams of peace radiate all the beauty of our shared humanity. With it comes the blessing of so many of our Christian brothers and sisters in the world who embrace and encourage you, knowing that you, your faith, your inner strength and your dreams of peace radiate all the beauty of our shared humanity. And the translator finishes his translation for the uh, for those who are gathered here today in Juba. We'll now hear the blessing uh, given jointly by Pope Francis by Archbishop Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, 
and by Ian, Dr. Ian Greenshields, the moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of, uh, the Church of Scotland. the three religious leaders, uh, Pope Francis, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the general moderator of the Church of Scotland, together offering their blessing, especially to the young people and the children of South Sudan. Uh, the Holy Father, as you know, is not a native English speaker. And so a very special moment where he will pray in English in deference to the native language of the two other religious leaders here. And we hear traditional Sudanese uh, song and dance as a very fitting close to this meeting with displaced persons. And again, uh, we are hearing and seeing, for those of you with the video feed, a traditional dance to uh, close this meeting. I would like to thank Father David Gentry for joining me uh, here this afternoon. At the same time,